Look around you. Look to your neighbor. These are the people who are digging their hands into the dirt and are going to begin to take the first step. Independence from a corporate industrial food system. Take the first step toward a community-based regional food system that focuses on the health of our bodies the health of the planet, the health of the soil, and respect the farmers and the food for the precious gift that it is. It's not a new idea. This is where we were in 1943, right? San Francisco had one of the best victory garden programs in the country. We had hundreds of urban productive gardens like this throughout the city. That's how you start to solve the food crisis, by digging in. If food isn't brought to the forefront, the people are gonna bring it to the forefront because people are asking questions, they're getting involved with organizations, and you know, you get those little bubbles in the water, you know, a few minutes later the water's just boiling over. The bubbles are in the water. The people here in this country are already seeing that the system, the way it is, is not working. What are you gonna do as an alternative? There are other models out there, ways in which we're going to make our systems more socially just, more economically viable, more environmentally sound, and more important than anything, more resilient. It's a challenge for everybody to look deeper and see that the issues are really complicated, they're not black and white, and we need to look at every element as it is now and really look forward and see, well, where do we want to get to and how can we get there? Every neighborhood would have a corner store that sold fresh, healthy, affordable, local food. And those stores would be owned by the people who live in the neighborhood. It seems to me that people get it when I put it this way. Well, that points out the speed that this is coming on. More fossil fuel to bear on agriculture. Step up production, more monoculture, more pesticide to support the monoculture, more chemical fertilizer to support the monoculture, drive down the price of food. And it worked. We have been eating oil for 30 years, 40 years. When we began industrializing agriculture, we were taking labor out of the farm and replacing it with fossil fuel and technology. Most of the big innovations in agriculture were fossil fuel products, and they were very much the products of World War II. We took the munitions, ammonium nitrate fertilizer is bomb fuel, and we converted that to fertilizer. The same factories that were making bombs one day, and nerve gases, which became our pesticides. What those technologies allow you to do is monocultures, very large fields of the same thing. Moving from diversity to this monoculture allowed you to greatly increase production. Monocultures are also supremely vulnerable to pests, so you can't have a monoculture without pesticides to defend them. And this has been our policy. We have rewarded farmers for planting monocultures. If you are a corn farmer, we'll give you money to grow corn and soy, but if you want to put in a row of broccoli, that land is permanently ineligible for subsidies. It's illegal for you to diversify your farm. The food system is slowly poisoning all of us. It's almost like a silent, self-administered genocide for the population, and we don't notice. You know, if we just ate real food most of the time, we'd probably be a whole lot healthier. But then you have to figure out what's real food. And what's real food doesn't come from concentrated animal feeding operations, and it doesn't come from the big poultry companies. I think people have to realize that we're in a deep crisis here in this country, not only economic, but ecological and cultural and social and food. There's a food crisis here in terms of the quality of the food. The problem is that the crisis is hidden by all the subsidies, the bailouts and the printing of money that is coming out. It's hiding the crisis, postponing it so people don't feel it. It is a dysfunctional food system for the majorities, which works very well for a few corporations and works very poorly for the majority of the people of the world and is beginning to work worse and worse for the people here in the United States. So the fact that we are up against it is actually the most hopeful thing because there are short-term problems, the price of oil, water shortage, problems that are much faster than the long-term problems of climate that we're going to have to wrestle with and we are fortunate that the solutions to the short-term problems are solutions to the long-term problems. The reason why do you think we're weeding? Why do we have to get these, this grass out of here? So it won't kill the strawberries. Exactly. So the grass eats up nutrients that the strawberries need to grow. What I love about strawberries is you don't have to plant them every year. You just plant them one time, they come back. They love you. I learned how to do this in Mexico, a garden program. 
It was all organic. They liked organic because it cut their costs down and raised their yields, which is the exact opposite of what you hear here in the United States. Most of the farmers that I still work with today are uh, organic farmers. I don't think any of them are certified. It's much too expensive for them. They're not interested in an export market anyway. They're interested in feeding their own people. I think it's good to get your hands in the dirt. The vision is huge, and to accomplish it is huge. We cannot change the economic system as it is right now. We said, well, let's try to take food out of the economic system a little bit and go back to self-sufficiency as a concept. She just decided that she wanted to use her backyard to grow vegetables. And so it turns out we can have enough to serve probably 20 people out of this backyard. When I first got to Alamany, it was basically just five feet high in annual weeds. In those first eight to 10 months, Alamany Farm was kind of a guerrilla garden because we didn't actually have permission from the city who owned the land. I actually didn't know very much about farming at all. It was mostly due to my friend Justin who was also involved. He was basically teaching the rest of us, who are all amateurs, how to do what we were doing. We just started going there and just tried to figure out, okay, how can we start doing this now? My greatest hope is that we'll actually learn how to farm with nature. And now is the moment when that struggle over the future is being understood. Food production is the most impactful human activity on the planet Earth. In terms of landscape impact, there's nothing like agriculture because we have a generation of farmers who weren't taught those methodologies and that frame of mind that we're gonna work with nature. They were taught to basically battle with nature. But we understand more now because humans are evolving. Our knowledge is evolving. Our understanding of nature is so much greater than it was even 30 years ago. I think it's the greatest challenge that humans face now, how to actually produce food and not destroy the base upon which civilization exists, which is the natural world. Honestly, you know, I said to a group of folks the other day, we have to start thinking like squirrels about our food and the food system that we have here in Oakland, meaning that we should have little micro distribution points in our neighborhoods, you know, where there's always fresh food available. We should have like mad gardens like this that are in their various stages of development, growing food and get food to people and educate people about food. As long as we're thinking about food and it's part of our conversations in our communities, I think that over time, those sources will be there and people will think more wisely about how they treat the earth and how they interact with people because all that is all connected, you know. My experience was working grassroots with people and having people kind of change their existence through direct action. And so what I felt like was out of all the issues, you know, transportation and energy and all these things, that food was something that people could really do. I was really focused on, okay, I want to start a food growing project somewhere. And what I realized was that the space next to my mom's house was abandoned and didn't have anyone there and was a perfect location to do it. The garden projects that are going on in San Francisco and all the major cities in the nation that are creating food for neighborhoods are vitally important in terms of transforming the way people think about food. Vitally important in shaping consciousness. If I'm gonna do this anywhere in the world, I better start in my own neighborhood. I better start where I grew up and that makes the most sense. The amount of land that is available in Oakland where you have the most food insecure people, where you have the highest concentration of liquor stores, where they don't have access to any fresh food, not even in Safeway, there's 200 hectares. That's about 400 acres of available land. Well, that land should be given to the people so that they can produce food. It really did come out of just living in this community, seeing the conditions. There are no grocery stores here and there are wealth of corner liquor stores. I saw that and I also saw that there's all this vacant land. There are all these empty lots that are just sitting here. So as a person with a background in gardening, those empty lots to me looked like, wow, gardens. We started growing food here and then it wasn't enough. And so then we said, okay, let's see if we can borrow some more empty lots. And that wasn't enough. And it always flowed, like it was never difficult. People would always ask us, how did you do outreach to the community? And we never did outreach, you know? It was word of mouth. We are really about significantly grow produce in the city. How can we do that while involving our community? In 2007, I quit my job. I went to UC Santa Cruz farming gardening program. 
and I got a certificate. I learned how to farm organically and, and grow food organically. And I wanted to take that knowledge and that skill and pass it on to the students here at the Alternative High. Learning how to read labels was my first food awareness exercise in my life. So this heightened my awareness about food, the importance of food, and to think that something you put in your mouth can affect your behavior. That was a very revolutionary idea. Food, for me, it should be a subject at school, period. Not somebody who's gonna be a pre-med student or a nutritionist, no. Everybody learns about nutrition just part of their daily day. And that does happen when you have a garden. The good gardener is also talking about the importance of nutrition. How do you harvest this food? How do you prepare this food? What does it do for your body? What's the essential vitamin in it? If people get to know that and appreciate that, that sort of sets the appetite for lunch. If they have that skill and that knowledge, it'll be passed on to the next generation. This will be a healthy family that's producing healthy kids. Now we got a healthy community. Oh my God, we got a healthy nation. My thoughts right now are really around how do we scale up the work? We reach hundreds of people, and for those individuals, what we're doing is extremely significant. But we need to really look at thousands of people. There's 30,000 people in West Oakland. We really need to reach them. I took about two months with a friend of mine where we traveled around the state interviewing people, farmers, activists, nonprofit workers, people who lived in farm worker communities, all these different people who had something to do with what I was considering the sustainable food system. And my goal was to really get a sense of who was the system, what was it, and what were the main challenges to actually making a sustainable food system more mainstream. So the water pollution, the extinction of the species, the extinction of the salmon, the air pollution quality, the cancer rates are all yields of your design. You're just not booking them on your balance sheet. And so how do we look to becoming eco-literate and go into the university of deep wisdom, which are native ecosystems, and emulate that with our agricultural endeavors? I'm always interested in how do you get people to see themselves as more than consumers, to see themselves as political actors in every aspect of every day of their lives. I feel like people in this country act like the only thing you can do to be political is vote for a new president every four years. And that's why having a garden or participating even better in a community garden where you're working with other people, that's directly engaging in that struggle. You're directly growing food, making this positive change, as well as challenging the things you don't like. The only way that change has ever really happened has been in people creating these grassroots alternative movements combined with actually putting political pressure on the system as it is. We're right now in the midst of writing a memo for the USDA and I would love to bounce that off you so that you, because what I'd love to do is have us echoing each other so that USDA is getting the same kind of data you're giving to the White House. I would say that 10% of my job is, is trying to figure out how Roots of Change as an organization could work. 30% of my job is networking meetings, developing relationships. 60% of my job is writing. If we're going to be a movement, we have to think about how to language. The language becomes a way of seeing the journey to a new place. We're working to combine you know, the NGO, Department of Ag in California, the Department of Health, and the Department of Education uh -huh. to bring to bear about $10 million of money from hopefully the CDC in order to really leverage and get more right. good food to low-income families through the farmers markets because we're doing this double voucher program. When you change your paradigm you have to reconceptualize it. You have to think differently to create the world differently. The other big piece is to bounce the thinking off people and that happens in the meetings. So what I have here basically is our report that grew out of the, the policy that was created for San Francisco, uh, which is a regional food policy in which the city is going to commit to buy regionally uh, with its buying power. It's going to develop up to 40 urban farms in the city. Talking about an idea, the struggle over what do we really mean by the reintegration of human beings into the natural world as manifest in the food system. But that has to be bounced off other people. If it just stays up in one person's head or a bunch of people in their own silos head, it doesn't mean anything. You have to bounce the ideas and create synthesis in the way people think. Connect at a local level. And I think that we probably have a sympathetic audience over there. So I'll give it a good pitch. That would be great. And then they get to have the conversation at USDA and then they're going to have it with the Congress. Eventually, all that thinking, which begins in all those different rooms on people's computers, ends up becoming written into law over time. That's what it's about. That's the system of how society changes, I think. That's how I conceptualize it anyway. You know, we're doing all this work for sustainable agriculture, and it works. And yet, these are still small islands of sustainability. 
Even if you're more resistant, more resilient, more sustainable, spread the wealth better, feed more people, it's not enough just to be a good farmer. In fact, you also need to be an advocate and an activist, and you need to create the political will in order to make the changes that you need. A new concept called the food sovereignty concept, which is developed by the Via Campesina in the developing world, is basically a concept on not only food security, not only access to food, but also to provide all the resources that people need in order to have food, that is land, that is the seeds of the crops that are not patented, the local seeds that have been preserved, the water, and the education and the human capital, everything that's needed, all those components have to be present. This isn't something one legislates, even though it entails legislation and policy and whatnot. It's something which is socially learned, and that means sharing our knowledge, sharing our experiences. As people move towards food sovereignty, they not only have to share amongst themselves, they have to share with others. How did they do this? How did you do that? By educating people, by engaging in discussion, by promoting more awareness of what's going on in other parts of the world, maybe people can see that if in other countries it's possible, it is also possible here. This is concretely happening in other countries, and I think it's time now for the North-South exchange. It's not just the North always teaching the South, but the South has a lot to teach us today in terms of alternatives to the system. Farming is the kind of work that people are really, really hungry for. Anyone can do this. Anyone can find a place that is misused or unused and get a group of people together and go and start using it to grow food and empower your community to connect with each other and feed themselves. The struggle to preserve this land, I think, needs to continue. Focusing on closing the gap between production and consumption is perhaps the most revolutionary act that can happen today because that will have also implications in terms of energy use, in terms of greenhouse emissions, in terms of resiliency to climate change, and in terms of food justice. I like to refer to the Occupy moment, not the Occupy movement, because I think that we've all been working towards different projects. The food justice projects that have been happening before Occupy, they're going to keep going, and now they're just inspired and influenced by the tactics and the models and the rhetoric of the Occupy movement. Now we're at this Occupy moment where we're able to take that opening where people are actually having to discuss these issues and confront them. Even people in power who don't want to discuss these issues are having to deal with them. We have an opportunity to actually bring this up and to combine the Occupy moment, the Occupy movement with all our values as the food movement. And that's what I think is happening here. Things are happening, it's like seeds being planted. The mass population doesn't know there is this bubbling coming up. And the longer this goes on, the more people will join and see the common cause that we all have. We're not going to be able to just wait for the senators to realize that food justice is important, or for the president to decide that Monsanto's dollars for his campaign are not as worth it as his constituents' voice. We can't wait for these things to happen because they never will happen. We know where power really lies. Power lies in people. And we intend to start slowly, but certainly taking back the power we know we have from those who have been deciding arbitrarily that they are the ones who know what's best for us. We're doing it with diverse communities, trying to do it openly and transparently, and hopefully create some of the structures that we want to see exist in our future democratic, ecological, economically just society, but also have a good time while we're doing it, grow some food for some people, be out in the sun working together. I think there's so many ways in which this kind of action defines both the opposition to the things that are wrong and the creation of what's right. This is lateral, and it's growing outward, and there's more and more people involved every time. Everybody having a say, everybody being involved, and so it, this is just a small microcosm of what I hope can grow into a bigger system in this country. We're not the minority. We're not the fringe. We're the cutting edge. And there's cutting edges all over the globe. I need to constantly remind myself that 
the world's always been crazy, that people have always lived in crazy times because you look around and it seems nuts. I went from, I am going to escape to the country, I just need to learn how to grow food first, to the only place we're going to solve these issues is the city. I feel like I'm part of a large group of people who are trying to steer a boat through an incredible storm. And there are a lot of people in mainstream agriculture and organic agriculture and industrial food systems. Even in those places, I come across lots of people who see the same problems and want to deal with it. And so I have lots of hope when I see that. We have to find lots of ways to rediscover that food can connect us to the earth, to animals, to plants to our families, to our friends, to the farmers, to all the hands that bring that food to us. It's just assumed in so many societies that you won't eat without acknowledging that whole web of connection that every plate of food has. We changed it all and I'm thinking the basic tenet of life is to wake up in the morning, work really hard growing food, to share the work and the experience with your community and your family, come home, prepare a harvested meal, a great well-cooked meal and have fun and laughter. That's the day, that's the life. That's what it was about. We've added too many things to it. And that's why a lot of us are ill. We don't take care of and eat the food that we're supposed to eat. It's a huge mushroom boy. It's an old saying, if you keep doing the same thing you're doing, you're gonna get what you got. And that's what society is gonna to happen to society. You're gonna keep having this crazy cycle of violence, crazy cycle of disparity, inequity, injustice. But when you try to do the right thing. This is the tip of the iceberg right here, all the vegetables and things like that, but the massive underside of it is thousands of worms and decaying matter and all sorts of interesting microbiological activity happening down here that just, it blows my mind the more I learn about it. So you just take these little clothes and you just stick them all around, hide them in the garden, make sure they get right under the soil. And you put them down like maybe an inch in the ground. Oh, it's cool. You can just make sure that, that goes to the bottom because that's where the roots will come out. I put garlic in my eggs too. Oh, yeah, it's a good garlic. 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 This old gentleman who lived around the school came over and we were talking about the garden. We were excited about it. He said, Oh, baby, we did this before. We had a garden here. Y'all just don't know we had a garden here. We had a victory garden here. And garden is a tradition here at Malcolm X. I'm so glad to see you back. I was like, this is the history, you know? We thought we were doing something new and should have known, you know, the history of the school's been there 100 years. Somebody had a garden there. This is not nothing new that we're doing, but it is a renewal in a way, if you think about it. Because what have we done in this society? We have added iPods and technology and communication and cars and telephone and texting and sexting and all these things, and we've forgotten why we're here. What's the most important thing? You can't text, iPod, sex, or anything without good health. <laughs> this is hard work, but it's fun too. It can be. So I'm doing the Zen meditation. This is what I call it. So I'm telling them in the classroom, you guys want to go out and do some Zen meditation? And they're like, yeah, yeah, what's that? I said, it's gardening. It's weeding. I think it's a real opportunity to truly understand and feel, you know, physically, emotionally feel the fact that we're not separate, that we have to come together in communities in order to deal with the messes that we've created. 